Hey, good morning. I would love uh, if you would stand with me as we uh, enter into a time of worship. I'm going to call us to worship from Psalm 16 as we enter into the third week of Advent, which is uh, the time in the church calendar when we slow down and really turn all of our attention and all of our focus toward the birth of Christ. And so in this season uh, of Advent where we really lean into the longing of our hearts, uh, our, our, great, our heart's greatest longing uh, is to see Jesus. And our heart's greatest longing is for him uh, to reveal himself to us, uh, to dwell with his people again. And so in this uh, time between Thanksgiving and Christmas, that's what we focus on. Uh, we look back at the first Advent, uh, his birth, the incarnation, and we look forward to the second Advent when he'll come and dwell with his people forever. So in in light of that, uh, let us hear this call to worship from Psalm 16, verses 9 through 11. I hear the word of the Lord. Therefore, my heart is glad, and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure, for you will not abandon my soul to the grave, or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life, and in your presence there is fullness of joy, and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Let us worship together. Sing this out. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. While shepherds kept their watching, or silent flocks by night, behold, throughout the there shone a holy light. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. The shepherds feared and trembled when low above the earth rang out the angel chorus that hailed our Savior's birth. Earth, go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Down in a lonely manger, the humble Christ was born and brought us God's salvation that blessed Christmas morn. Born gold, sell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Gold, tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Let's do it again. Gold, sell it on the over the hills and everywhere go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born that Jesus Christ is born you guys can grab a seat for a second there, I forgot, thought I, was, I forgot I was supposed to preach. I was up in my office. I was like, wait a second, this doesn't feel right. Oh boy, what a day. Um, we are uh, in our Advent series, the third week. We're going to have one more week uh, before Christmas. Uh, but in this, uh, in this series, we are trying to do something where we couple uh, a passage of Scripture uh, that is likely familiar to us uh, with a song that is also likely familiar. And so we want to take these Christmas songs that we sing and kind of discuss uh, the, like the miracle that's behind it, the miracle behind the music. What do we mean when we sing these songs? And this morning, uh, we're going to sing a song uh, about, it's called God Rest Ye Merry Gentlemen, uh, a song that you likely know, um, but is also a little confusing uh, because it's very important where you place the comma in that song. Uh, it's like that phrase, like, let's eat grandma. Like, it's important to put a comma in there. 
And with God rest you merry gentlemen, it's God rest you merry, comma, gentlemen. Uh, so the gentlemen aren't merry, the rest is merry. Um, and you're super bored by that, but I promise it makes sense. Um, because what we want to see is that when we look at the passage uh, that talks about Simeon, who we're going to talk about today in Luke 2, um, that his rest that is won for him, the peace that he feels, um, is only possible uh, because of Jesus. And so the only way that we can rest Mary um, is because Christ has come, Christ has been born. And so uh, that changes everything. It changes how we uh, see ourselves. It changes how we uh, view life. And so uh, we're going to look at Simeon this morning in Luke chapter 2, if you'll turn there. Uh, Luke 2, verses uh, 22 through 35. Luke 2, 22 through 35. Uh, so let's give our attention to the reading of God's word from Luke chapter 2. And when the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus and to do for him according to the custom of the law, Simeon took him up in his hands and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that, have prepared, that, that you have prepared in the presence of all people. A light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and the rising of many in Israel. And for a sign that is opposed and a sword will pierce through your own soul also. So that your thoughts, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. Uh, let's pray together. Father God, we come this morning um, carrying uh, all kinds of weights. Uh, we have the weight of, uh, of wondering when you'll return, uh, the weight of wondering what is responsible socially, uh, how do we uh, gather together, uh, how, do we, how we miss gathering together, how we miss our friends. And so uh, as we read uh, stories like Simeon, uh, we're reminded that you have not forgotten us, that you... Uh, are with your people, uh, that you are Emmanuel, God with us. And so, uh, Father God, your son, Jesus, who we love so much, may he uh, remain that. Let us see that, uh, that he is, is wonderful. Uh, let us see him as beautiful. Uh, Holy Spirit, invade our hearts. Uh, move us to the throne. And in your son's name we do pray. Amen. Um, you know those little reminder cards that you get in the mail from the dentist? Or like if you're at, a, if you're at an appointment and they kind of hand it to you before you leave, you're supposed to put it on your mirror. Um, I ignored those for about 20 years. And uh, every time like one would come, I'd be like, ah, it's fine. I'll just, I'll get it next year. I'll get it the second time around. And um, it, was, it was a while back, um, I, I think it was around 2012 or 13, that my mouth started feeling really weird. Like if I drank something that wasn't like room temperature, it really hurt. And I was like, oh, man, I should probably answer those cards. Um, but I was, I was a seminary student. I was also working as a contractor on the side. I didn't have dental insurance or any money. And so uh, I was like, I guess we'll just see what happens. I guess if they fall out, they fall out. Um, but uh, a friend of mine, like, set me up with her brother, who was a dentist. And so I went to visit them and didn't really know what to expect. It had been a long time since I'd been in the dentist. And uh, I was greeted by this, like, sweet little lady named Jenny. And uh, I was like, oh, she makes, like, the doctor's office, like, fun. And so um, Jenny, like, took me back to this room, and she's like, here's what's... I was like, what do we do? Like, what, what do I... Do I just lay here with my mouth open? Like, what, what are the rules? And so she's like, yeah, you just sit here, and, like, the dentist will come in, he'll check things out, um, and then you'll leave. And uh, so the dentist walked in. His name was Dr. Dixon. Um, I hadn't met him up until that point. Um, but he walked in, he was enormous. He was like 280, like 6'5", and I was like, oh man, this guy's going to have his like sausage ham hocks in my mouth, and um, he's going to root around there, and this is going to be terrible. And he like comes in, you know, like clangs a couple things around, and he's like, well, Jenny's going to come in, she'll clean you up, and then, uh, and then you'll be able to get out of here. 
And I was like, oh, that, this, is, this is very painless. I was like, she's basically just going to come in and brush my teeth. Um, and so Jenny comes in, uh, sweet little Jenny. I then quickly discover that she probably worked for ISIS at some point. Uh, or she interrogated prisoners at Guantanamo Bay because when she like when she laid that chair down and started sticking stuff in my mouth like it was awful y'all um, there's stuff flying all over the place she's got a welder's mask on there's like things are flying all over the place they had this little bib on me that was like the size of a paper towel with a chain on it and it's covered in blood it looked like somebody shot a deer and I was like what are you doing to me uh, and she's like hey your mouth is terrible. And this is going to take, like, multiple cleanings. And I was like, what happened to the sweet, like, little Jenny, the, like, 105 pounds soaking wet when I walked in? Um, and I ended up having to get adult braces. It was awful. Y'all, brush your teeth. Um, make sure to floss. And what I realized at that visit was, as they handed me this sheet that says I was going to have to come back every month for the next 24 months, I was like, this is awful. Um, and this is not what I expected. Uh, but it's what I needed. Uh, it's what I needed uh, for everything to be made right. It's what I needed to not have any more pain. It's what I needed uh, to kind of have peace with all that was going on in there. Um, when we read this passage about Simeon um, and when he meets Jesus, uh, we, we're introduced to a Jesus that isn't likely the one we expected. Um, we've heard uh, the birth story, like tender Jesus, meek and mild. He's laying in the manger. Uh, the ox and the donkey are around him. Little drummer boy's there for some reason playing music. Um, I'm like, he's a baby. Leave him alone. Um, and so we hear the story of Jesus laying there. But Simeon's going to introduce us to the Jesus who's going to come and, and kind of disrupt some stuff. Um, he is going to be for our peace. Uh, but he's also going to bring uh, some conflict um, that the Jesus that's before him is going to bring the tidings of comfort and joy uh, that we'll sing about. Um, but Simeon tells Mary here, uh, this is going to cost you everything. Um, that the baby that you're holding, um, you're going to watch him die. Uh, the baby that you're holding uh, is going to save the world, um, but it's going to be really painful. And so uh, in this passage, we're going to look at a couple things and then sort of a point of application. So we have the peace of Christianity. Uh, what does Christianity bring us? Uh, we have the price of Christianity. What does Christianity cost us? Uh, and so what? What does this mean for us? So let's dive in with the peace of Christianity. If we look back um, at the beginning of the Luke 2 passage of verse 22, uh, Jesus is taken back to the temple. Uh, Luke introduces us to Simeon. We don't know a lot about Simeon. Uh, I don't know if it even matters, uh, but what we do know about him is that he is righteous and devout, and he's been told by the Holy Spirit that, that so he has this special relationship with the Holy Spirit, um, and is told that he's not going to die until he lays his eyes on the Messiah. Um, all of his hopes have been placed on this promise. Um, everything Simeon does is kind of stamped with this promise that he's not going to die uh, until he sees Jesus. So he goes to the temple every day, sort of like Anna we talked about last week. Elliot uh, told us about her. Um, every day he's at the temple, you can imagine uh, any baby that walks in, he's likely looking and wondering if that's him. Simeon remained hopeful that God would keep his promise because Simeon knew scripture. Uh, he was righteous and devout, which means that he likely would have studied scripture a lot. Uh, he knew that God has never forgotten his people. He knew that the grace of God kind of chases out this fear of being forgotten. And Simeon lived at the pace of grace. Uh, he trusted that, that God would move in God's timing, um, which is one of the most difficult things to do, as the great theologian Tom Petty told us, uh, that waiting is the hardest part. Uh, think about all his promises in Scripture, uh, all the ones that you sort of hang your hat on um, or post on Instagram. Um, or have lettered on your wall. Uh, these promises of God that you're just waiting for them to come true. Uh, the promise that he's going to come back uh, and, and make everything sad untrue, that he's going to come and fix it all. Uh, the promise that he uh, is going to give us uh, what we desire, that the desires of our heart, uh, that he will give us those, uh, that if we're righteous and that if we 
confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive those. Think of all his promises. Uh, and then think about how anxious we get in those uh, and how we doubt those and how we're fearful of those. Imagine Simeon looking at every baby that comes into the temple only to be told, not today, like he's not here yet. So Simeon, by all accounts, was just this ordinary guy living an ordinary life with gospel intentionality. There wasn't necessarily anything super impressive about him, uh, but for whatever reason, uh, he had a relationship with the Holy Spirit uh, that, was, uh, that was a little extraordinary. And what's true for Simeon is true for us. Uh, the Holy Spirit, uh, the third person of the Trinity, um, he is available to us. Uh, he's hard to understand. I don't even necessarily understand him that well. Uh, but I know that, that Jesus says, I've left my Holy Spirit with you as a comforter, as a guide, as a helper. And Simeon had all that, and that's available to us. Uh, there are two things, if we ask for it in the New Testament, uh, that we're guaranteed to get. One is wisdom, the book of James. If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask. Uh, and the second is the Holy Spirit. Uh, that God gives good gifts to his children. So if you continue to ask for the Holy Spirit, you'll get the Holy Spirit. Um, and so Simeon has him. He has that relationship that's also available to us, even though he was just sort of ordinary, he was just sort of an ordinary guy. Um, he, he didn't have like a Google alert on his phone for when Jesus would show up. He just sort of went there hoping that he would show up. And so he's there, uh, it says in the passage by the Holy Spirit, led him to the temple um, that morning, and this morning was going to be different because in the outer courts, there was this young couple with baby. Um, this young couple, Joseph and Mary, and baby Jesus were there some 40 days after he was born. Uh, a couple of kids too poor to afford a big sacrifice, right? There's like a sliding scale to the sacrificial system. If you had a ton of money, you got a bull or a goat or a lamb and brought it. If you weren't rich, you got like two turtle doves and just brought them. Uh, God never broke the backs of the poor. Uh, the, the poor are very important to God. Um, and in his justice and in his mercy, uh, Joseph and Mary are bringing this tiny little sacrifice to the temple. And uh, what's sort of ironic or, or a little crazy about that is that these two kids who were entrusted by God to raise the Savior of the world, uh, bringing these two turtle doves with them, uh, they're bringing like a sacrifice with them while the one who will end all the sacrifices is in her arms. Uh, that they're bringing Jesus to the temple and that temple is gonna be obsolete pretty soon. Um, it's gonna be torn down. Um, and yet the living temple uh, is in her arms. Uh, it's, the, it's this delicious irony in this Christmas story that the savior of the universe would be bundled up in some baby clothes and Jesus doing for us what we could not do for ourselves, which is fulfill the law. Um, even at 40 days old, uh, Jesus is fulfilling the law. He's fulfilling the law of Moses. He's coming to the temple. Uh, they're offering the, his family's offering the sacrifices. Jesus is doing the work of Jesus uh, even as a tiny infant. And Simeon is led by the Spirit to approach this couple. And it's sort of this great and sort of creepy story because he just goes up and takes the baby and puts it in his arms. Uh, don't, hey, don't steal babies. Um, but Luke paints it for us in verse 28. It says, he took him up, he blessed him and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. When Simeon saw Jesus, we call this the song of Simeon. The song that he wrote is like, I can die now. I can die now in peace because God has fulfilled his promise. It's sort of that feeling I get when I take a bite of brisket down at Edley's that, hey, I can die now and everything's fine. Like, my kid will get some money from life insurance or whatever. He'll be fine. Um, Simeon looks at the baby and says, I can now die peacefully. God rescue Mary, comma, Simeon. Rest is yours. Peace is yours. The Prince of Peace is finally here. Scotty Smith says this, what a glorious and holy paradox that Jesus, by whose arms all things have been made and are sustained, would rest dependently in the arms of an old man. Whether or not he expected to die soon, the peace that resulted from that embrace changed everything. Uh, what Simeon found in the arms of Jesus was the grace to die well. Um, that he, even in the face of death, 
uh, Simeon can have peace because of what this baby represented. Uh, It isn't just that he waited and waited for his eyes to land on Jesus. It's that Jesus, uh, who he was holding, was actually holding him. Uh, Jesus had been holding Simeon since before Simeon was Simeon. Um, That Jesus was holding him, that as Simeon delivered Jesus back into the arms of his mother and his father, it would be Jesus who's going to deliver Simeon into the hands of his heavenly father. Uh, That Simeon... Uh, at this meeting would be changed, that Jesus uh, would be the one who's in his parents' arms, but he's also ruling the universe. Uh, And we don't know if it was the next day or the next month or 10 years from their first meeting. All we know is that Simeon wasn't afraid of death anymore. Uh, J.C. Ryle described him as this, Simeon spoke like one who for the grave has lost its terrors and the world its charms. He speaks like one for whom the grave has lost its terrors and the world its charms. Simeon had found peace. Uh, The future no longer scared him. His past no longer defined him. And the siren call of the world no longer enticed him. He had found something in the face of Jesus that far outshined the beauty of the world. He had found something in the face of Jesus that pierced a blinding light into the darkness of the unknown. And Simeon says, I can go in peace. I can walk, uh, I can leave this world knowing that God has kept his promise to me. Uh, That promise that gave him the courage and the grace to press on without fear. Uh, John Patton, uh, he served as a missionary to the New Hebrides in the South Pacific. Uh, Vanuatu is one of the islands if you watch Survivor. Um, So he was a missionary to the New Hebrides and the South Pacific. And um, this tribe that uh, that he was going to was notorious for killing any missionary that tried to show up. Uh, So anytime a boat landed, a missionary got off, they were were almost instantly killed. Um, They were also cannibals, and so they were eaten. And so the missionaries were killed and eaten by this tribe. They hated missionaries coming. They didn't want any outsiders. Um, This was done as a message to the mainland. Quit sending folks here. We're just going to keep killing them. We're going to keep eating them. And Patton's at his church, and he's kind of doing a vision dinner. And uh, he's talking about how he desires to go back to the New Hebrides. His first trip was cut short uh, because his wife got sick, so he came back. Uh, And then his second trip, he was like, I want to go back. And uh, an elder at the church, a guy named Mr. Dixon, was vocal against him going back. He's like, we can't fund this. It's a suicide mission. This doesn't make any sense. Uh, so during the meeting, Mr. Dixon uh, stands up and says to John, John, they're cannibals. If you go there, you're going to be eaten by cannibals. And uh, Patton responded, Mr. Dixon, you are advanced in your years now. Shut up, old man. Uh, And your own prospect is soon to be laid in the grave, there to be eaten by worms. And I confess to you that if I can but live and die serving and honoring the Lord Jesus, it will make no difference to me whether I'm eaten by cannibals or I'm eaten by worms. And in that great day, my resurrection body will rise as fair as yours in the likeness of our risen Redeemer. It makes no difference if I'm eaten by cannibals or by worms. Because in that great day, my resurrection body will rise as fair and as beautiful as yours in the likeness of our Redeemer. Patton had a peace uh, about what would happen. Um, Like he made peace with the worst case scenario. That the worst thing they could do is kill him and then he would be with Jesus. There's a peace that comes from knowing that Jesus holds us in his hand. Uh, There's a peace that comes from knowing that Jesus holds forever in his hand. In the Gospels, it says that he has us in the palm of his hands, and no one can come and snatch us out. Uh, He holds you, and when you look at the thing that scares you the most, whatever it is, it could be dying and being eaten by islanders, it could be public speaking, uh, it could be going outside, Um, whatever that thing is that scares you the most, Jesus has said you can face it because of me, because I faced death and he made it through on the other side and that we can have the peace that Simeon had, that Jesus has come for weary, unstable, ordinary sinners, um, that he loves those, that he loves ordinary people living ordinary lives with gospel intentionality. But Simeon was led by the spirit to say one more thing before he departed the temple. 
Uh, he sang of the peace that was made available to him. But he looks at Mary, and this is in verse 30 and on. He looks at Mary and says, uh, this baby uh, is going to break your heart. Um, that the rest offered to all who believe meant that because he is the Messiah and the anointed one who's going to die for our sins, it meant that this baby was likely going to die before his mom did. And Mary uh, is standing there hearing these words. Uh, it's like, Mary, did you know? Because in case she had forgotten, Simeon was here to remind her exactly who she had given birth to. This is going to be our second point, the price of Christianity. We've looked at the peace. Uh, what, is the, what does it give us? Now we're going to look at what it costs us. Um, if we look at uh, the Song of Simeon again, in verse uh, 35 especially, a sword will pierce through your own soul so that the thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. Um, and in the verses prior to that, Simeon is saying to Mary that Jesus will be for the rise and the fall of Israel uh, and that he'll make room for the Gentiles to come through, uh, which would have been wildly countercultural. Uh, because for a long time, the Jews believed that they had an exclusive claim on the Messiah, that he was theirs and nobody else's. He was going to be the king of the Jews. He was going to lead. Uh, He's going to be this strong, valiant kind of military leader who would overthrow the captors, set the captives free, uh, that he would reign forever. Israel would no longer be under the thumb of, of foreign rulers. Uh, but Simeon knew otherwise. Uh, Simeon knew this Messiah. And while he was certainly going to be for the glory of Israel... While it was certainly good news for Israel that, God, that Jesus was here, that God was among them now, uh, it was going to serve as a light of revelation for the Gentiles. Uh, God rest ye merry Gentiles, because Jesus has come for you as well, that the outsiders now have a seat at the table, uh, that the outer courts where Joseph and Mary were, because uh, they were too poor to come in, um, because she would have had to have been certified as, as clean before she could enter. All that's going away now. Um, Jesus, uh, this is why he gets so mad at the temple and starts turning over tables, is because they were blocking the Gentiles from coming in. So Jesus comes in, uh, he starts flipping stuff over. In Ephesians, it says that Jesus even breaks down the dividing wall of hostility between them, and that he's going to be for all people. Uh, and this would have been wildly countercultural um, that Jesus was for the Gentiles as well as for the Jews, um, which means that racism has no place in God's kingdom, uh, that, that they all sit at his table, that we're all there, that there would be no separation between the poor and the rich in God's kingdom, that those who uh, have a turtle dove sacrifice or those who drive a Tesla have the same need for Jesus. That Jesus is here and everything changes now. That the huge wooden door of history hinges on this man. And how Israel responds to this man, Jesus, will determine her fate forever. Jesus will be for their falling or for their rising. And in our own hearts, we have to do business with this. Uh, as we sit here this morning, we have to look at this passage and say, Jesus is for your rising or for your falling. Um, you can accept him or you can reject him, but you can't ignore him. Uh, the things that Jesus says, we can't ignore those. And Simeon is saying, he's going to make these claims about you, and he's going to make these claims about himself that have to be dealt with. Uh, that when he says that he is the only way to God, that no one comes through the Father but through me, we have to do business with that. Uh, that when his word says that, or when he says in John 15, that apart from him, you can do nothing, uh, we have to do business with that. Uh, that Jesus will be for their falling or for their rising. Accept him or reject him, but you can't ignore him. Um, and that uh, it's either life eternally in heaven with him or life reserved for hell without him. Uh, Simeon is saying it's either Jesus or it's death. Because what Jesus is not is just like a good guy. I hear that a lot. Um, I love what Jesus says. Like he's a good teacher, but there's no way that he's like the savior. There's all kinds of ways. Uh, there's all kinds of ways up the mountain to get to God. It can't just be through Jesus. Like those two statements are so opposed to each other uh, because a good, nice teacher can't say the things that Jesus said and still be thought of as a good, nice teacher. He's either like cat lady crazy 
uh, or he's a son of God. Um, and that's it. Um, that he is going to cause a division, Simeon says, and then we have to make a decision about that. Uh, and he looks at Mary and says, a sword is going to pierce your heart. And here's the thing about Jesus and causing division. Um, if you're here this morning and Jesus hasn't caused some sort of division in your heart, uh, it's likely because you're not following him. If Jesus hasn't blown up something in your worldview, uh, then you might not be following Jesus at all. Uh, Singer-songwriter Jason Isbell, uh, one of my favorite guys to listen to, uh, wrote this song called 24 Frames. Uh, and, in the, and in the song 24 Frames, he says, you thought God was an architect, and now you know. He's something like a pipe bomb, and he's ready to blow. And everything you built that's all for show goes up in flames in 24 frames. We look and think of God as one who uh, like sees the things that we want and then just kind of helps us get them. Uh, but what Isabel is saying, what Simeon is saying, what the Bible says uh, is that God actually comes in to your life and blows all that up. Uh, he's the cosmic Guantanamo Jenny that's going to come look at your mouth and he's going to start ripping stuff out. Um, that he is... Uh, that this tender Jesus, meek and mild that we sing about actually comes uh, to pick a fight. Uh, that there's a lot of talk about who Jesus is, uh, especially now, especially in the current political climate we find ourselves in um, and just in the midst of the pandemic itself. Uh, a lot of people are claiming that Jesus is on their side. Um, that you have the Republican Jesus or the Libertarian Jesus, you have the Democratic Jesus, uh, maybe Jesus is this passive hippie who just wants us all to smoke some weed together uh, and just let everything kind of be okay. Um, is he uh, a hard-charging hard businessman like you'd find in Atlanta who wants us to accumulate all this wealth? Um, is he laid back and cool like we would find in Nashville? Uh, we, have, we have conversations about how Jesus would handle the border detainees uh, and conversations about how Jesus would handle covid uh, how he thinks about lavender essential oils or screen timers for our kids. Uh, we can throw him on a t-shirt. We can slap him on a bracelet. We've done all these things to try to neuter him and domesticate him, but Jesus doesn't let us do that. Simeon is saying here, Jesus is going to come in and he's going to cause a division um, in everything we think about him, that the crowds will always have an opinion about Jesus but Simeon points to this Jesus and that, that's sitting in his arms uh, who will demand that you answer the question, who do you say that I am? Uh, he asks this question to Peter and the disciples uh, when they're sort of uh, chatting about, hey, here's what they're saying about you out there, Jesus. And Jesus says, I get that, but who do you say that I am? Am I the one who never crosses your will? Am I the one who always supports your plans? Or is he the biblical Jesus that welcomes sinners and welcomes saints? Is he the biblical Jesus who dared to let a whore wash his feet uh, and dry it with her hair? Um, is he the one who overturned tables in the temple because it was blocking access for the Gentiles? The one who told uh, some crotchety do-gooders when they called a woman in adultery to cast the first stone? Um, is he the Jesus who met with uh, super smart Nicodemus and the Samaritan train wreck of a woman at a well. Uh, whatever we think of Jesus, it has to be what the, what the Bible informs. Um, so Jesus is going to come in, and he's going to cause a division. And that, um, the Jesus who prayed for the guys who were plucking out his beard as he was dying, that they would be granted forgiveness. That as he looks at a thief next to him on a cross who's done nothing good to earn Jesus or to earn heaven, Jesus looks at him and says, you're going to be with me in paradise. Do we think of Jesus in those terms? Has he come in to the chaos that is our hearts, all the messy grossness that's there? Um, has he walked into our hearts and says, I'm going to start moving some stuff around? This is what's terrifying about Jesus, is that there are doors that are locked in our heart, and when Jesus comes in, he starts jiggling the doorknob a little bit. Uh, it's like that episode of Friends where Monica has all that junk in the closet, and she doesn't want Chandler to see it. Like, Jesus comes in, and he walks right to that junk closet and tears the door off and says, we're going to work on this together, and it's terrifying. 
Simeon is saying, this is who Jesus is. Is Jesus allowed to cross our will? When you think about your own relationship with Jesus, and you think about the things that your heart desires, who wins? Do we take scripture and bend it to our own will? Or do we take our will and bend it to scripture? This is the division that Jesus causes. This is what Jesus came to do. And uh, Jesus looks at you and says, you're bought with a price. Uh, that he's going to come and he's going to die. And, that, and because you're bought with a price, it means he actually has a say over your career. And he has a say over your spouse and over your mouth and what you do with your body. The peace that comes with Jesus also brings conflict. And you will have conflict within your heart. You're going to have conflict within your heart about whether you should repent. Um, you're going to have conflict about whether you should forgive your roommate, uh, whether you should ask for forgiveness from your roommate, whether you should ask for forgiveness from your spouse. Um, that Jesus comes and speaks um, of how we handle sexuality, how we handle our money, how we love the poor. Um, bring those conversations up at Christmas when you go home. Like that'll, cause, that'll be a good time. Jesus isn't always going to land on our side of the argument. Um, if, we, if we have a Jesus who lands and always agrees with us, it's probably not the biblical Jesus. Jesus isn't always going to side with us on our side of the argument. Annie Lamont says that, we, uh, that God created uh, man and woman in his image, and we have forever tried to return the favor uh, that we always try to create a God in our image. Um, Simeon is saying, Jesus isn't going to let you do that. But here's the question. Why does this matter? Uh, why does it matter what some old man said to Mary a billion years ago? It matters because of this. That back in, way back in the beginning of the Bible, uh, Genesis, the, book, the very first book in chapter 3, um, before Adam and, Eve, Adam and Eve had just sinned and before they're kicked out of the garden, uh, God makes a promise to them. And he says that the seed of the woman, uh, so there's going to be one who comes from Eve's line, who's going to crush the head of the serpent. The serpent who has just uh, tempted Adam and Eve, caused the fall of man, caused the mass chaos that you experience every moment of every day. Um, that one is going to come and crush his head. And we love that promise. Uh, it's called the, it's the first gospel presentation that's, that's in the Bible. No human has ever been born that that's not true for. Um, that anyone who's ever taken a breath has had this promise over their lives uh, that God will send someone who's gonna crush the head of the serpent. But the back half of that promise says that he's also gonna have his heel bruised, that there's gonna be a blow dealt to Jesus who's gonna crush the, the serpent's head that means that Jesus is gonna die on the cross. Um, it's going to cause his death. And Simeon is looking at Jesus and is telling Mary, he's not just here to shake up political systems. Uh, he's not just here uh, to make sure you can put him in an essay and get into college. He's not just here uh, to kind of do what you think you want to do. Uh, Jesus is here to die. He has a mission, and his trajectory is set uh, toward a bloody, lonely hillside um, and the cross of Calvary hanging there where he's going to be placed on the cross and stripped naked in front of his own mom. Talk about a sword piercing a heart if you're a parent. Her own son is hung up naked in front of her, hung up to die for the sins of all those who believe. But this is what Jesus is for. This is what Simeon's song is about, that God that what God will demand of Jesus will break him. That the sword will come to pierce Mary's heart, but it's not going to cut off her head. The sword that's going to come and pierce lands on Jesus. Uh, that in that moment when he cries out from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's met with silence. There's no answer. Um, we talk a lot about how the silence of God is terrifying. This is the most terrifying moment. That when Jesus cries out to his father, he doesn't answer him. And he dies. The sword that comes and falls on his head, the sword that was meant for us, falls on the head of Jesus so that we'll never have to know what that feels like. After they were kicked out of the garden, Adam and Eve uh, were told that 
Uh, we're told in scripture that flaming swords guard the entrance to the garden, uh, that man could never enter into that again. That flaming sword is what Jesus walked through and died so that we could be restored, uh, that we could even be restored to something greater than Eden, that we can have Jesus and a relationship with him. Friends, the birth and the death and the resurrection with Jesus assures you eternity with him. His resurrection confirms our own, uh, that God keeps his promises, that what Simeon believed, that he wouldn't see death until God fulfilled this promise, is true for us. Uh, that God keeps his promises to us, and this is something that no sacrifice of turtle doves or bulls or ox or goat uh, or any striving of our own could ever afford us. We don't bring anything to Jesus in order to follow him, but we do have to lay a lot of stuff down. Uh, we have to put down our weapons. Uh, we have to lay down our arms. Uh, we can't, uh, the only thing we can bring to Jesus is the sin that makes salvation necessary. Uh, we come to Jesus with arms, arms wide open and say, Jesus, command as you will. That the sword will never touch a hair on his head. That in Jesus, if you're connected to him, you're free from the wrath of God. Uh, that is absolute, you can bank on it, uh, that there's not an ounce of wrath reserved for you if you're connected to Jesus. All that wrath was poured out on him. You're free from that, but you're not free from God's love. And sometimes you probably prefer the wrath because he's gonna pursue you and he's gonna chase you down. He's what Martin Luther calls the great hound of heaven uh, who when we run is after us who takes the shepherd's crook and pulls us back in, who also takes the shepherd's crook and cracks us on the head, that Jesus is so fiercely committed to you and you're never free from that love. And that is the best news you could hear. Um, that the sin that has so easily entangled us, and that, uh, that the writer of Hebrews talks about, the sin that so easily entangles us will be thrown off and will run straight into the throne room of, of God and see him face to face. That Jesus will come into your heart. As Isabel said, he's gonna blow some stuff up, um, but he's gonna chip away those areas that we don't look like him. Uh, this is the sanctification process. And we will find peace. Uh, we will be able to rest to Mary like Simeon does. That we will find peace. You'll find tidings of comfort. You'll find tidings of joy. Uh, and you will find someone, in, you'll find in Jesus someone who will conquer both the fighting within and the fears without. O Lamb of God, we come. Let us not shrink back. Let us not shrink away, but follow Jesus into peace. Let's pray together. Our great and gracious Heavenly Father, uh, this morning as we hear those words uh, straight from your mouth uh, that landed on the pages of Scripture, um, Holy Spirit inspired, uh, that you would uh, make those words uh, come to life in our hearts. Uh, that as we hear of your goodness, that our hearts would leap with joy, just as John the Baptist leaped in the womb when he met Jesus, that we would, that we would leap and run to you, uh, that our hearts uh, would not be bitter, uh, would not be calloused, uh, but would be uh, broken down by the great hound of heaven, uh, the seed that crushed the head of the serpent, in whose name we do pray, amen. Would you stand? And as you stand, uh, let's sing this song of reflection together, um, keeping in mind this great Lord who, who uh, in the middle of, if you've forgotten, if you are someone who has come in here tired and weary, um, the Lord calls us to remember. Um, this, this song is calling us to remember uh, in this Advent season what it is he's done. And what he's done is he saved us from Satan's power when we had gone astray. Uh, and that should stir us in our hearts uh, towards comfort and joy. So let's sing this together. God rest ye merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. Remember Christ our Savior was born on Christmas day. 
to save us all from Satan's power when we were gone astray. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy. In Bethlehem in Israel, this blessed babe was born and laid within a manger upon this blessed morn, to which his mother Mary did nothing take in scorn. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy, oh, tidings of comfort from god our heavenly father a blessed angel came and unto certain shepherds brought tidings of the same how that in Bethlehem was born the Son of God by name. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy. To the Lord sing praises, all ye within this place. And in true love and brotherhood, each other now embrace. This holy tide of Christmas, of beauty and of grace. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. Oh, tidings of comfort. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus. Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know the saith the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I trust him more yes tis sweet to trust in Jesus just from sin and self to cease just from Jesus simply taking life and rest and joy and peace and jesus jesus how i trust him how i have proved him more and o'er jesus jesus precious jesus oh for grace to trust him more I'm so glad I learned to trust the precious Jesus, Savior, friend, and 
and I know that Thou art with me, wilt be with me to the end. And Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I proved Him more and more. And Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. Let's do it again. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I proved Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. I'll sing this out. If my heart is overwhelmed and I cannot hear your voice, It's a storm of life that come and the road that gets steep. I will lift these hands of faith. I will believe. I remind myself of all that you've done and the life I have because of your son. before you God staying humbled at your feet I will lift these hands and praise I will believe I remind myself of all that you've done and the life I have because of your son love came down
I want to thank you again for uh, joining us this morning, Home Churches. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, before we head out, I'm going to do a benediction from Hebrews chapter 13. Uh, we will uh, deliver, I'll deliver this benediction, and then we'll sing the doxology together, uh, and then we can depart. Uh, but hear this benediction from Hebrews 13. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep by the blood of the eternal covenant, Equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's sing the doxology together.